Okay, folks, uh, while we're getting started, please feel free to keep introducing yourselves. It is really good to see everybody. Uh, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for being here and welcome to Zeminus Unionism. Uh, for folks who don't know me, my name is Zach Patton. I'm a fourth generation waterfront worker at the Port of Tacoma in Washington State and a member of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union, Local 23. I'm also a member of Tacoma DSA, and I currently serve on the steering committee for the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission. Uh, we'll say a little bit more about the DSLC later, but first I wanna introduce our two guests for tonight. We got Tony Gilpin and Carrie Thompson. Uh, Tony is a labor historian, a writer, and member of Chicago DSA. She is the author of The Long Deep Grudge, a history of the Radical Farm Equipment Workers Union of which her father, Duet Gilpin, was a leader and is co-author of On Strike for Respect about the Yale Clerical Workers Strike from 1984 to 85. She is a regular contributor at Labor Notes, including a series on working class films and a member of the DSLC's education subcommittee, helping develop our Labor 101 curriculum and other materials for DSA members to use. Carrie it was born and raised in Texas. In 2006, she became a rank and file member of the United Electrical Workers, the UE, and then a leader of local uh, 896 at the University of Iowa. She joined UE staff in 2013 as a field organizer and currently works as director of international strategies and co-director of education. She is a DSA member and previously served on the DSLC steering committee and currently lives in Ashland, Wisconsin. Uh, real quick, I just wanna say, aside from uh, DSA and the DSLC, uh, Carrie, Tony, and I all share something uh, special and unique in common, that is our unions or our families' unions. We're all one-time affiliates of the Congress of Industrial Organizations and specifically constituted a block referred to as the CIO's left-led unions. These 11 national affiliates, which included our own, as well as the mine mill and smelter workers for in leather, the United Public Workers and others, once made up about one quarter of the total CIO membership, which is about a million individual workers until they were expelled between 1949 and 50, uh, alleged to be under so-called communist domination. Uh, within only a couple years, most of those 11 unions were driven out of existence and only the ILWU and UE remain to this day. Uh, these purges had a really drastic effect on the course of organized labor in the US, uh, ramifications of which we still deal with today as both workers and socialists. I'm gonna leave the details of that shared history and its legacy for uh, Tony and Carrie to tell, but first I wanna hand it off to Carrie. Uh, let's just jump right into this to talk about her union and how this history is reflected today in what UE calls them and us unionism. So um, there's a poll that's popping up on the screen too. If folks wanna go ahead and fill this out as Carrie is getting started, we would appreciate it. But Carrie, if you could, can you tell us a little bit about the UE's vision of a radically democratic militant unionism and why your union chose to publish this pamphlet right now? Thanks Zach. And thanks to all these folks for being on there's like more than 150 people on. And so that's really awesome. So thanks for taking the time to do this this evening. I wish I could see more of your faces, but um, yeah. So I, as Zach said, am a, a member of UE and staff person for UE now. And um, we started talking about this booklet, Them and Us Unionism that I'll pull up in a little bit, um, well more than a year ago prior to our current uh, state of affairs in the world. And uh, we were really talking about the need for a piece of literature to address a couple different audiences. One was just our own members because we have a lot of new people in our leadership, either because of retirements from folks who've been around for a while or because of new organizing that we're doing. And we just really wanted to be sure that we were doing a good job of our own internal political education to make sure that we were passing on the uh, the kinds of philosophy and approach that really grounds the structure of our organization and the way we go about doing our work. So that, that was one audience. But then the other audience is really this one here. So thank you all for being here again. Um, 
we saw that there was a lot of renewed interest in the labor movements from our, all over the country and certainly among young people. Um, renewed interest in work, workers just having a voice at work or um, using the workplace as a site to build for justice in the world. And we wanted to be a part of a conversation about what it looks like to have a strong union to do that work. And we wanted to make sure that our perspective was represented for folks who are new to this idea. Um, and I, maybe we'll wrap up the poll here in just a few seconds so we can share with folks who all is here because um, it is a great diversity of, of people who have joined us tonight. And you know, when people start talking about worker representation, there is inevitably some negative discussion about unions, maybe ones that people call business unions or unions that operate more like an insurance agency than a worker organization, right? Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were part of the conversation of sharing with people what the alternative is, because I think those waters can be a little bit more muddy for people. Of what does it look like to do something different? And, um, and so that's where the idea for this booklet came about. Um, the, the ideas in the booklet itself are not new, but they might be new to, to some of you all. So the work for this was already underway and then the pandemic hit, which made it clearer than ever that workers really need to stand up and fight to protect themselves and their families. It's clear right now that our employers don't prioritize our health and safety and you know, unfortunately neither do our politicians. So to be effective in that fight in this very present moment, workers need to understand how our economy works, how workers can harness our leverage and how we can therefore organize ourselves to win. And that's really what them and us unionism is about for us, which is really the foundation of UE. So um, I'm gonna say we should go ahead and end the poll here and share out with folks who all are, are here. Um, let's see. So we have a, like a third of folks who are already a union member. Um, and then we have a lot of folks who have some other kind of relationship to the union world, but then more than 40% of folks who don't currently have a union home. And that's great. I'm really glad you're here and learning about this too. So I hope that some of what we discussed tonight might inspire you to, you know, figure out how you fit in with the union world and what you'd want things to look like for you at work if you were to have a union. So um, this all really starts the kind of foundation of how we position ourselves in the world and in our society has to really do with us as workers. And I'm gonna run a quick exercise with you guys, which is one that we run with our members when we talk about them and us unionism right now. Of course, it's via Zoom because you know we're in this pandemic moment. So um, JP, if you go ahead and launch the other set of poll questions. So there's two poll questions that popped up right now. And if you are one of those folks who's retired, please answer these questions from the perspective of when you were working before you got your pension or your 401k. So the first question is, do you rely on a paycheck to pay for your housing, food, utilities, and other bills? Yes or no? And two, do you spend a significant portion of your time working to earn that paycheck? So give everybody just a moment to fill that out. These are really important questions for thinking about how we position ourselves as workers. Maybe we'll give people just a few more seconds to answer these questions and then we'll we'll go ahead and um, and for unemployed folks, I see that is coming up in the chat. Maybe you can can answer um, from the last time you had a job or from the, the the perspective of how you're spending your time while you might be looking for work, right? Um, that is this is in itself itself is a thing that definitely requires energy. All right, so we'll go ahead and close this up and we can share those results with folks. So this is, you know, pretty typical. 95% of folks on this call said they rely on a paycheck to pay for their housing, food, utilities, and other bills. And 92% of folks feel like they spend a significant portion of their time working to earn that paycheck. 
And these are really important questions because they really position us as workers, right? That we rely on work to meet our needs and the needs of our family. And that without work, we wouldn't be able to have a dignified life. And that that is key to understanding our position in our society, but also in our relationship with our bosses. So when we talk about them and us unionism, that's the us, we're the workers. We're the ones who you know, rely on work to, to get things done. Um, so who's them? Well, them, is, that's the bosses, or you might call them the capitalists, or you might say the 1% or the owners, whatever you like to, to phrase that as. They're, they have fundamentally different interests than we do as workers. They don't have to work to make ends meet in the same way that we do, right? They profit off of our labor and they want to keep as much of that profit as they can. They want to keep the status quo, right? They don't want to have to do the wage labor that we do in order to get by. And um, that means that we have just really pivotally different interests when it comes to our relationship with workers and bosses. And for UE, this is really foundational for thinking about how we center our work and how we operate as an organization. I'm going to go ahead and just share really briefly um, the uh, booklet that I'm talking about. I'll put a link here in the chat. So if people want to pull it up themselves, um, you can go to ueunion.org slash them and us. But uh, you can get this in English or in Spanish if you prefer. Uh, you can scroll through it and there's also a PDF version you can download and print if that's preferable to you. But uh, this, it's not a very long booklet, so I'd encourage you to, to read through it sometime when you have a chance. Our booklet highlights a lot of um, pieces of our history that are really pivotal. I'm not going to go too much into those uh, right now. I think Tony's going to hit on some of those important points. Um, but then it also really focuses on these principles that are really important to us. One of the things that is in here and is always really important for UE is the preamble to our constitution. And I'm not going to read through the whole thing here, but I, I would encourage you to read through it sometime. The preamble contains at least three of the principles that we highlight elsewhere in the book and really is key to setting us apart as an organization and is it really influences all the work we do. Um, in my current role in our education department, I end up highlighting our preamble in almost every workshop I give because it's so key to sort of highlighting why different things are important for our members and for the work that we do and how we situate ourselves with other workers and with the bosses. Um, so, you know, as Zach mentioned, we were a founding union of the CIO, but we were expelled along with the ILWU and nine other unions for uh, what was labeled communist domination. And really what that came down to was sticking to these ideas, right? That we are workers and we have fundamentally different interests than the bosses, them. And um, we continue to be an independent union we're independent of the AFL-CIO. We do work with AFL-CIO unions in certain ways. It's not that we can't collaborate with others, but um, our independence does mean that we are sometimes critical of the way the mainstream US labor movement has embraced the idea that maybe workers and bosses might share common interests. And we think that really just can't be the case under capitalism. I'm going to just really briefly touch on the five principles that are in the booklets and um, we will, I think, refer back to these as we continue through the webinar and I'm happy to share some examples of more of like what these look like in practice. But for those who haven't read the booklet, I'll just kind of run through what some of these are. Um, the first one is aggressive struggle and uh, this is really the idea that workers, when we use our power together, we can do things that disrupt business as usual for employers. And that 
will get us what we want, right? So that we have more power when we engage in mobilizing our members together. So this is in contrast to a more legalistic strategy of just relying solely on arbitrations or the labor board. It's not that we don't do those things also, but those tactics remove power from the workplace. So we want to focus more on mobilizing our members to get what we want and not just relying on a third party to say that you know, we played nice and we, we make a good case, right? Um, our power is in our labor. And so the more we can do to uh, showcase that, the better. The second principle is rank and file control. And I think this is a phrase that gets discussed a lot these days. What we mean by this is that it's really the members who should have a clear vision about what we're working for as an organization and that there is a role for leadership in drawing that vision into fruition, right? And offering some direction, but that they can't do it without the support of the members or they won't be able to succeed in that way, right? So for us, what this ends up looking like in practice is just a high level of membership engagement um, in doing a lot of member education because the skills that it takes to run a union are not necessarily things that members just automatically know, right? So in order for people to run their own union, we, we try to give them those tools, everything from finances to contract bargaining. Uh, the third principle is political independence. And um, this is a pretty key one that distinguishes us from a lot of unions. UE doesn't have a PAC. We, um, we don't ignore the political arena. We recognize that it's very important, but we don't think that we can get the influence we need there by just giving money to candidates. Rather, we wanna see politicians actually embracing the kinds of ideas that will empower working people and will, will cater to the issues that we think are important. So we do things like political action days in state capitals, I mean, pre-pandemic, right? Um, or in Washington, DC, to have our members go talk directly with their own representatives, rather than having some lobbyist who's never actually worked in the shop talk about something that they don't really know about, right? We want our representatives to hear directly from us. The fourth principle is international solidarity. And it's really clear that under globalization, you know, we, can't ignore the working and living conditions of people in other countries. And all of our living conditions are linked together. So the idea of international solidarity is that we have to work collaboratively with workers across borders because corporations can move capital wherever they want much more easily than workers can move, right? And um, we do direct worker to worker solidarity exchanges to try to foster these kinds of relationships between our members and workers in other countries. The final principle, but certainly not the least important is uniting all workers. And this has been very pivotal. This is one of the things that's in that founding preamble that uh, we have to fight to overcome discrimination and to bring together working people from all backgrounds, regardless of race, gender, religion, or political belief um, in our workplaces and in society. These are ways that the boss divides us. And when we are divided as workers, then we can't fight the boss. The boss benefits from that, not us, right? And so this is um, you know, a key part of who we are as an organization. So um, that's kind of the general summary of the, the booklet and what it means to have these principles of a, a them and us union to make sure we're censuring this conflict between workers and bosses as having different kinds of interests. And I'll stop there that, uh, as, a, as our introduction. Right on, thank you, Carrie. Uh, so Tony, uh, Carrie just talked about UE's style and a little bit about what the union is working on today as well. Uh, I'm wondering if you can help us out and tell us more about where this particular labor orientation comes from and a bit about the history of the CIO and its left-led union specifically. 
uh, maybe in particular your dad's union, the farm equipment workers. Right. Um, thank you, Zach and Carrie, and uh, for the work you're doing to actually put into practice this them and us unionism right now. And so I'm really honored to be here with you. And thanks to the DSA for putting this together and this amazing uh, turnout. So it's really um, exciting and impressive. So I'm happy to be part of this. And my job um, is to provide a little bit of a historical context. And so some of what I'm going to say is going to repeat a bit of what Zach already said. Some of this, many of you out there who are really versed um, will know, some of you may not. So I'm hoping I'm going to hit the sweet spot of the right information to convey. And I've also got some visual aids. And since I'm more of an academic, I'm going to be kind of given an actual talk. But let me put my some slides up. All right, is that everybody see those? Okie doke. So um, as, as they have told you, of course, Zach and Carrie are affiliated with the UE and the ILWU, two unions that like so many others were familiar with, were born during the surge of activism and organizing that occurred during the Great Depression and which led to the founding in 1935 of the New, La New Labor Federation, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. Those unions that made up the CIO in open distinction to the craft-based unions that had existed since the 19th century were committed to organizing workers on an industrial basis, meaning for instance, that all workers in a factory, whether they were skilled electricians or assembly line workers or janitors, and regardless of race, ethnicity, and gender, would become members of the same union. The UE, as Carrie noted, formed in 1936, was one of the CIO's first unions and soon became one of its biggest. It had a membership of 600,000 in the 1940s, representing workers in giant plants then operated by the likes of GE, RCA, and Westinghouse. Though longshore unions had long existed on the East Coast, the ILWU emerged out of the mass uprisings and general strikes that occurred in San Francisco and other West Coast cities during the 1930s and received its CIO charter in 1937. So the UE and the ILWU had much in common with the other original CIO unions like the Steel Workers and the United Auto Workers but by the end of World War II, it was already clear that there were some sharp distinctions as well. As has been already uh, spoken about, the UE and the ILWU were among those unions, which depending on your point of view, came to be labeled as left wing or radical or communist dominated. Communist party members, or at least those with communist Marxist leanings, had been integral to the founding of most CIO unions, and in some, their influence remained significant. The UE and the ILWU were in that group, and so was the union that I've written a book about, as Zach slightly points out, the farm equipment workers, known as FE, that organized workers at firms like International Harvester and John Deere. As the Cold War heated up and anti-communism became official US policy, ideological division fractured the labor movement. And those radical anti-capitalist unions found themselves increasingly besieged by a host of enemies, the federal government and its investigatory arms like the House on american Activities Committee and the FBI, a hostile red baiting mainstream press repressive local governments and police forces, and the anti-communist wing of the labor movement itself. The Taft-Hartley Act specifically targeted union leaders with communist party ties, and the CIO initiated a purge of those unions it condemned as communist dominated. Thus, the mighty UE, the ILWU, and the FE, along with several other unions, as Zach noted, representing nearly 1 million workers were expelled from the CIO in 1949. Connected to that expulsion 
the FE entered into an autonomous affiliation with the UE. And in fact, in the UE booklet, in the Demonus booklet, there's a photo of a protest against the House Un-American Activities Committee that's made up mostly of FE UE members. Of those expelled unions, as we um, know, only the UE and the ILWU are still around. The FE broke with the UE in 1955 to merge with the UAW. And if you want a deeper uh, dive into the hows and whys and significance of all of that, um, I encourage you to read my book. So that's the brief historical outline, but what were the characteristics of those radical unions and in what ways did they differ from what we can call the labor establishment? Kerry has laid out the principles the, of them and us unionism that guide the UE. And Zach is gonna speak about how those um, similar principles uh, work in the ILWU. So I'm gonna speak briefly about the left-wing union I know best to consider the ways in which the FE reflected this them and us, us, them and us approach. So one of the FE's leaders put things pretty succinctly. The philosophy of our union, he said, is that management has no right to exist. Such a perspective, needless to say, stood in sharp contrast to the more cooperative ethos that became the predominant ideology for the labor establishment following World War II. It, this was not just some esoteric abstract debate. The ideological distinctions between the left and right in the labor movement affected contract terms and defined how workers could and should respond to injustice on the job. Anti-communists like UAW President Walter Ruther maintained that an expanding economy with cooperatively achieved production levels could benefit everyone, management, workers, and consumers alike. The 1950 UAW General Motors Treaty of Detroit was the most famous exemplar of this philosophy. A five-year contract, including cost of living and productivity pay increases, in other words, rewards for increased output, along with good benefits to GM workers, but which also obliged the union to partner with management to ensure efficient, uninterrupted production. As a result, the contract also included a stiff no strike clause and limited shop floor representation. The class conscious FE leadership, on the other hand, believed that such a cooperative framework, quote, belies the fact that there is only one side for business, its side, and that it operates on the principle of getting as much as it can. It can be deterred in its exploitation only by applying economic and political pressure 365 days a year. FE leaders rejected the concept that economic growth could equally benefit labor and management. They eschewed the politics of productivity as reflected in the Treaty of Detroit in favor of the politics of class conflict. So what did that mean in practice? FE leaders opposed long contracts, preferring one-year agreements as they saw value in the agitation attendant to negotiations. They opposed cost of living and productivity pay increases, believing that they limited what workers were entitled to. They believed that unions should do everything in their power to slow work down rather than assist management to speed it up. So they resisted no strike clauses and embraced a large and aggressive steward body committing to resolving workers' grievances immediately. This combative rank and file centered ideology had a measurable impact within the workplace. Between 1946 and 1954, at the dozen or so international harvester plants represented by the FE, encompassing about 30,000 FE members, there were over 1,000 work stoppages. Think of that number, 1,000 walkouts. That's an astronomical figure representing walkout rates during that period that far surpassed those at UAW plants, for instance. But within the FE, there was a practical reason for all this disruption. Through it, workers got what they deserved and promptly. As one local FE leader put it, if something happened to a worker today and we walk out, his case will be settled in the morning. Every walkout, every time we walked out, it got results. 
that is what aggressive struggle as outlined in the UE's pamphlet means. So the FE's militancy distinguished it in the post-World War II era, but so too did the union's commitment to uniting all workers as the UE booklet also um, outlines. Farm equipment factories were located mostly in the American heartland, some in Chicago, but others in small towns and more rural places. As a result, the FE's membership was about 80% white. Nonetheless, the FE, as a result in large part of its leadership's connections to the Communist Party, maintained a top to bottom commitment to interracial unionism. How did they do that? From its founding, the FE's top leadership included black officials and from 1946 on, the FE had both a black executive board member and a black vice president. That sort of representation was then unheard of. Unions with far larger percentages of African-American membership like the UAW, the steel workers, and even it must be said in this period, the UE had no blacks in top leadership positions. As opposed to many other unions like the UAW, the FE fought for and won contract terms like plant-wide seniority that were most likely to benefit African-Americans. And one main focus of my book is the FE's extraordinary local in Louisville, Kentucky. In 1946, Harvester, International Harvester opened a plant in Louisville, hoping as so many other companies did to take advantage of the low wage non-union South. Harvester hired some African-Americans for production jobs, which was unusual and then segregated Louisville. The workforce though was about 85% white and many of those white employees came into the plant as hardcore racists, many of whom had only recently left rural Kentucky and reflected generations of animosity towards African-Americans. Nonetheless, in its organizing drive at the plant, when it was competing against several other unions, the FE in contrast to the other unions also seeking recognition made it clear that its program was one of interracial unionism. The union itself would be fully integrated and committed to fighting for blacks as well as whites on the job. It was therefore rather astonishing that the FE won the representation election even more remarkably, the FE local then challenged Harvester on the lower wage scale, what was called the Southern Differential it planned to introduce in Louisville. After a strike in 1947 that lasted over 40 days in which the membership's interracial solidarity was deepened, Harvester relented and raised wages for all workers in the plant. The Southern Differential strike underscored the FE's message that only through solidarity could both black and white workers get what they all truly deserved. But this wasn't the end of the story for after that strike, the FE continued the very hard work of combating racism in the shop and the larger community. Civil rights activist, Ann Braden, who worked with the FE in Louisville, indicated that the FE carried out um, what she said quote, was a constant campaign to convince the white workers that only by solidarity of the Negro and white workers could the union be strong. Just exactly all of what that entails, again, we'll read um, my book, but I will say that one of the mo more moving aspects, I think, of the story that I tell about the FE and Louisville are the personal accounts from both white workers who detail their own struggles to overcome their own racist heritage and black workers who talk about what such interracial unity meant for them. So I, I think that's enough about the FE for right now. And, but I wanna say that those who are interested in a deeper dive into the history of radical unionism from the 19th century through to the present, I encourage you to join what will be the inaugural DSA labor history book discussion group coming up in February that's going to focus on my book and that's it. The book is for sale right now at Haymarket Books for just $13 between now and uh, January 4th, I think. So there's going to be more info for anyone interested in signing up for this labor history discussion group um, in a follow-up email that everybody on this call is going to get. So no worries um, about needing the details right now. 
Um, so just keep a lookout for that email. But before I go, I want to underscore one more thing for this audience in particular, for um, DSA members who are socialists. And something that I believe is crucial to the creation and perpetuation of radical unions or them and us unions, or frankly, simply effective unions. And that is having leaders with a sharp Marxist understanding of capital, labor, and surplus value. That brings with it an imperative to be conscious of all times of where workers' power is located and how that power can be best leveraged in fights against employers. Radical unionists also remain committed to the proposition that it is workers themselves, not managers, not administrators, not outside experts, and certainly not CEOs who truly understand the labor processes they're engaged in and how they could be designed not to degrade people, but to fulfill them and how work could be purposed to create a just society rather than simply to meet the rapacious demands of the 1%. So having concluded now, I'm gonna get out of here, send this back to Zach so that he can talk about what, how this is all working in the ILWU right now. Sure, thank you, Tony. So uh, just real quick for folks who might not be familiar with us, the ILWU or the International Longshore and Warehouse Union uh, represents roughly uh, 40,000 workers, primarily, uh, as our name suggests, in longshore and warehouse work along the uh, U.S. West Coast, as well as British Columbia and Canada, Alaska, Hawaii, and uh, in Panama. Um, in addition to longshore and warehouse workers, uh, folks who have been around DSA for the last couple of years might have heard about the anchor union and the organizing effort at Tartine Bakery. That was with our warehouse local six in San Francisco. Shout out to all you from DSA San Francisco who are a huge part of that and East Bay. Um, as well as the uh, Powell's Books workers in local five uh, in Portland, Oregon. We recently started organizing um, veterinary, veterinary technician workers. Uh, and we also have a Marine division that's known as the Inland Boatmen's Union of the Pacific or IBU that primarily represents uh, ferry and tugboat workers, but also uh, cannery workers in Alaska. Uh, like Tony was talking about, our union came out of the uh, Great West Coast Waterfront Strike of 1934, um, which is best known for the general strike that took place within it in San Francisco in the middle of July in the wake of the murder of two workers, Howard Sperry and Nicholas Bedouaz, uh, who um, were standing outside of the Union Hall along the Embarcadero, it's like the waterfront part of town in San Francisco when an unmarked uh, police car drove up and two plainclothes cops jumped out in front of the Union Hall with guns in hands uh, and fired into the crowd and hit several dozen people and murdered two of them. Uh, this is the day that we continue to recognize as Bloody Thursday on July 5th, where um, ever since uh, this murder in 34, on the anniversary of that date, we refused to work. Uh, for the first several years, it was something of an insurgent sort of like wildcat action. Um, it was like an unsanctioned stop work activity where we just flat out refused to work on July 5th to take the day off to um, honor our martyrs and celebrate our victories. Uh, it's now codified into our contract as a non-paid uh, day off. With that, um, one of the main sticking points about why we went out in 34 was the fight for the worker controlled hiring hall, which as a lot of people have commented over the years is really like the defining feature of the ILWU or at least its longshore division. Um, it was a cause that a lot of folks have reflected on was worth dying for. It was against the really brutal system of hiring um, that existed previous to it that was referred to as the shape up, which was rife with discrimination and extortion and kickbacks and other forms of abuse. Uh, when we won in the, uh, at the end of the summer in 1934, we were awarded this uh, hiring hall and the arbitration award and uh, it exists in somewhat modified form, but still retaining like its basic characteristics where we now elect our own dispatchers to oversee the assignments of jobs on a daily basis. 
uh, longshore workers have the right to pick their job assignments or not pick certain things that they don't want to do on that day to bounce around from one terminal or one job category to another on a daily basis. Um, and this, along with a lot of other sort of like aspects of our uh, early history is something that I argue is part of like what has kept uh, our union unique um, by enshrining the, the radical vision of our union's founders, uh, people like Harry Bridges, but also Henry Schmidt and others, uh, many of whom were in the communist party or who were long accused of being in it like Bridges, um, had a radical vision not too different from the kind that uh, Kerry and Tony were talking about with their respective unions. Um, with that, with the hiring hall come principles, not just about workers control, but about democracy and equality and a principled commitment to non-discrimination in all of its forms. Um, along the lines of uh, what Carrie was talking about with them and us unionism and these five basic principles uh, in the ILWU, we got 10 guiding principles that go back to our uh, biannual convention. I just shared those in the comments if folks want to check those out. Um, in 1953, coming up on the 20th anniversary of this big strike in 1934, uh, in here are principles about union democracy, about labor unity, about non-discrimination, about uh, the need to organize the unorganized, international solidarity, and uh, opposition to um, jurisdictional rating and warfare, like Tony was talking about, like a big part of the downfall of a lot of these unions that were thrown out in the wake of these expulsions in 49 and 50 was unions attacking one another um, and taking over their membership rather than trying to organize the overwhelming majority of workers who weren't then or now still in unions. Um, so that's kind of the gist of it. Uh, for folks who are familiar with us, like aside from like the 21 year long struggle to try to deport our union's founder and longtime leader, Harry Bridges, uh, which resulted in five separate deportation trials. Uh, I think two of which went all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Smith Act, if you're familiar with that, was written in part in an attempt to get rid of him and was also used against a number of other labor radicals of a lot of stripes. Uh, is our uh, history of political action uh, on and off the job Almost immediately after we won in 1934, uh, with the rise of the labor movement and the left, as I'm sure folks know, there was also the rise of the right in fascism and Nazism uh, in Europe and here at home. We initially uh, or immediately started boycotting uh, fascist Italian ships, um, as well as German vessels that were flying under the swastika when they came into US ports. Uh, in one case, allegedly even sinking one right off of the dock in the East Bay uh, in California. Um, shortly thereafter, we engaged in boycotts against scrap metal that was bound for Imperial Japan because we knew that it was going to be turned into bombs and dropped on Chinese civilians. Uh, we took a very unpopular but very public uh, stance against Japanese internment shortly after um, uh, the bombing in Pearl Harbor throughout the 1950s. We provided a lot of really crucial support for Dr. King and the civil rights movement. In one case, even um, threatening to boycott Alabama cargo while Dr. King was in Birmingham jail. Uh, from the 1960s through the 1980s, we engaged in a very famous uh, campaign to end apartheid or um, the system of white supremacy that was uh, ruling over South Africa for most of the 20th century. Um, if you want to read more about that history, I would recommend a book called Dock Worker Power by Peter Cole, uh, who's a good friend of ours. Um, and actions up into the uh, 80s and 90s, like boycotting uh, cargo that was bound for right-wing military juntas in South and Central America. We did a one-day strike in 1999 demanding the release of Mumia Abu Jamal from death row. Uh, as well as shutting things down for the WTO protests in Seattle, boycotting uh, or refusing to work on May 1st, International Workers' Day in 2008 against the wars in Iraq uh, and Afghanistan. And up until uh, this year, where we first did a nine-minute action uh, on the day that uh, Brother George Floyd was laid to rest um, and followed up a few days later by doing a West Coast shutdown on uh, Juneteenth. Um, 
Also shout out to our DSA comrades in the Bay Area again for turning out in mass as a part of that action. So our union has, I don't know, like a lot of things in common with these others that we're talking about. We, part of what I'm trying to get at with this is that for us in the ILWU, like fights with the boss wasn't ever just about bread and butter stuff, though it's certainly that. Uh, I guess the other thing that we're really well known for, at least in like the Longshore Division, is having really premium wages and benefits and that sort of stuff. So that bread and butter stuff is important to us, like don't get me wrong. But um, what I've always have found very inspiring about our union's history uh, that I draw a lot of inspiration from, and I know many of other too, is that it never really stopped there. And we used our power, not just to help other workers organize, um, but to take action uh, off the job in ways that you wouldn't really generally, um, I don't know, consider labor union activities like meddling with US foreign policy and trying to bring apartheid rule down. Um, so that's a little bit about us uh, and where we come from. But to kind of go back to um, where we're at on this broader sort of theme, uh, I want to pitch a couple questions back to Tony and Carrie uh, for everybody else on the call. There is a Q&A box. Uh, if you want to ask us a question, uh, I'd encourage you not to do it in the chat just because there is a lot of stuff going on there and I'm afraid it might get lost. So in that little Q&A tab, if you have something specifically that you want to ask us for uh, discussion, go ahead. But to kick it off, um, I was talking a little bit about some of the ripple effects um, of my union of first like fighting the employer and winning control over hiring and having great power and leverage over the workplace, which we then use towards other ends, like away from the job and not just around conventional union workers stuff as it's you know generally considered. But I'm curious to know, what are the other sort of ripple effects of radical unionism like this uh, as found in our principles and how do these things radiate um, out into your communities like past or present. So Carrie or Tony Aiden, if you want to do, yeah, go for it. Shall I start, Tony? Um, I think one example of this ripple effect that started as a job action, but had a much broader set of implications is an example that is highlighted in the booklet. Um, in 2008, UE Local 1110 did a sit down uh, you know, occupation of their workplace, Republic Windows and Doors in Chicago. And um, I think it's a really relevant example for us to discuss right now because the political timing and economic timing is very similar. So the background of this is, you know, this is a low wage shop with a really diverse workforce of black, white and immigrant Latino and La Latino workers. Um, many languages being spoken in the shop, and they were a solid UE local, right? They'd gotten gotten our political education. They were very active in the organization, and they heard that their employer was going to be shutting them down, and um, they started to get a little bit more information about this, and it sounded like the, the employer was actually going to literally run away with the shop. They were gonna come in in the middle of the night and steal the equipment and close down and not pay the workers their uh, you know, shop closing, severance pay, and just hightail it out of town. And this is a kind of really extreme example of you know, capitalists being able to move their property around even though they don't know how to operate it, right? Um, because they didn't want to pay good wages to workers in Chicago where the cost of living is higher and they wanted to move the work elsewhere. And the workers occupied the shop. And uh, I think I can safely say now 12 years later that um, this wasn't exactly encouraged by UE staff, right? Like the workers did this. <laughs> Um, and then we we had to go along with it, right? And make the most of this. And it actually became a really pivotal battle during the 2008 financial crisis. You might recall the, uh, the, the chant during the Occupy movement of banks got bailed out, we got sold out. 
that started there outside that shop. And this became such a big deal. It was during the transition from President Bush the second to Obama that Obama had to comment on it. And it was through Obama's pressure that the workers ended up negotiating with Bank of America to, you know, it took many years, but a huge settlement and ultimately control over their own workplace. It's now a worker owned cooperative. So if you need, if you are in the greater Chicago area and you need some energy efficient windows, you know, you can, uh, you can look them up, but that's, that's not really the, the point of the story. The point of the story is that this small shop action had broader implications for workers who from really diverse backgrounds understanding that their struggle was one and that their struggle then became representative of the struggle in a community where everyone was about to experience huge financial loss because of banks gambling with people's housing uh, loans and um, and the loans they were giving out to big businesses and things like that. And this is people's livelihoods, right? And there was huge community support for this strike. People sneaking in pizza and all sorts of things, right? And, and um, the politicians who understood where our principles really came from, right? They, they were out there. They joined us on the picket line. It wasn't all, everybody in Chicago, I can tell you that much, but the, some key people were there. And I think it serves as a really important example right now that you never know exactly what the moment is gonna be that you need to seize and be ready to make the issue really clear. That it's workers who deserve to get the profit from the work they do, not the bosses. And um, you, know, you never know exactly when that story is gonna happen that can help really shift that narrative. And that was a really important part of actually the build up into Occupy um, of people really realizing that the stratification of wealth in our country was really out of control. Um, so I, you know, I can't take credit for all of the Occupy movement. Obviously, there are many other forces there. But that political radicalization of the leaders in this shop was absolutely key to making that strike, that occupation successful and also for um, you know, impacting the broader community. Right on, thank you, Carrie. Sorry. Uh, Tony, do you wanna say more about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, I can follow up uh, being uh, a Chicagoan myself, but also um, because uh, you know, people think that sit down strikes, factory occupations, uh, pretty much ended in the 30s, or uh, many people think that, maybe not this audience, but a lot of people do, and um, certainly the Republic uh, door window example shows us that that's not the case. Uh, um, I've also got a terrific example of um, uh, a factory occupation, a sit-down strike in the that the FE engaged in 1952 in Chicago in an effort to prevent International Harvester from moving its twine mill, which made binder twine for um, uh, harvester combines to New Orleans. So another runaway shop, you know, now they go overseas. Initially, um, companies just moved their facilities south. Um, so workers, African-American workers, women, um, white uh, ethnic workers, Polish um, uh, and Eastern European, um, came together in that moment to occupy the plant and literally um, bricked back up the wall that the um, that the uh, company had uh, made to, to hoist the equipment out. So um, it's an exciting, dramatic story, but it doesn't end the way we would like it to. It's not like, um, and therefore International Harvester decided to keep its plant there. No, they went ahead and eventually after a lot of skirmishes um, did move that plant out of Chicago into New Orleans. Um, but uh, I think the difference between what radical unions, what them and us unions um, encourage their members to understand is that these jobs belong to you. They're not granted to you, they're not given to you. You put your sweat equity into these factories, into these offices, into these hospitals. Um, this is your property. 
And I don't think other sorts of unions encourage that kind of consciousness um, for workers, but you know, the, 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 uh, um, the forces that workers who um, would do those sorts of, um, take those sorts of actions, obviously that they're up against are pretty, pretty darn powerful. Um, so the other example I can point to um, in the farm equipment workers, or uh, one of them, in terms of what Zach was asking about, about um, the, the sort of um, militant uh, uh, approach to unionism on the job, how does that spill over elsewhere? So the Louisville story that I tell is also remarkable in that it is about shop floor radicalism, but also that these black and white workers, once they had found this unity and the importance of this solidarity actually then carry that struggle into the into Louisville. This is in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s um, to desegregate what was a segregated town. So they had actions in segregated parks in Louisville segregated hotels. Um, and these were the sorts of things that predated but really set the stage um, for the later civil rights movement. So, you know, everywhere you look in the South in particular, you're going to find those instances of these left-wing unions who are um, sowing the seeds for um, the civil rights movement that would come later. And I guess one of the last examples I would talk about is the FE and the other left-wing unions um, heavy involvement, maybe the FE more than any other union in the 1948 Henry Wallace campaign, this third party effort um, to challenge both parties as being um, corporate dominated. And, you know, I, I, I'm sure most of you know that, that Henry Wallace didn't get elected president. And in fact, the, the campaign um, ultimately, uh, you know, at least in terms of numbers of people who voted for Henry Wallace was a, a pretty much a disaster. But again, I show how the people that got involved in that campaign, especially in places like Louisville, uh, African-American and white, learned lessons about political organizing, community organizing that they then uh, generated and took into um, this other sorts of organizing. But, you know, the flip side of that is that this, the, the, um, the parts of the, of, of the UE booklet that have to do with international solidarity and political independence and that kind of political consciousness uh, transformation, that's the really hard work, right? That's, I mean, we, can, we saw that in the last campaign with what happened with Bernie Sanders. We see that with so many union members who are still voting for Trump. So they can be militant on the job, they can be committed to their union, they can understand that the bosses have nothing in common with them, but taking that consciousness and then expanding it outward and upward and into the community and into the political realm is, you know, really a difficult and uh, struggle that, you know, there has been a lot of uh, uh, not great examples of that in history. So um, I think we have to look at both of those things to figure out how we how we achieve that um, going forward, especially in DSA. Um, that's an obligation that we have is to not just make people good trade unionists, but to make them um, to 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 um, somehow connect those workplace struggles to these larger issues um, that um, affect them. So I'll stop with that. Thank you, Tony. Uh, just real quick. Uh, Tony mentioned something in passing about the story in Louisville and these sorts of efforts. Um, someone was just mentioning Ann Braden again about Louisville and these sorts of like pre-civil rights sort of CIO left-wing stuff that was going on. For folks who are interested and really want to do like a deep dive into that history uh, in the comments there, these are a couple of books that I really, really love. Uh, Robin Kelly's Hammer and Ho, obvious classic, but Robert Korstad's uh, Civil Rights Unionism about FTA, I think Local 22, um, and Michael Honey's Southern Labor and Black Civil Rights uh, about organizing in Memphis, Tennessee, all kind of cover different areas of uh, a strikingly similar history. Uh, with that, though, there was someone in the chat, uh, Josh, who asked, how does one go about breaking the idea of unions being bad in a place like Western North Carolina? Um, I didn't know if this went right back into what Tony was talking about Louisville, uh, or if Carrie wants to talk about some of the more like recent efforts to uh, by UE to organize in the South. 
So. Tony, why don't you start this one? I was just looking at all these great questions. So there's so many great questions. We have to get to all the right questions. Um, so yeah, that's that doing that, you know, and 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 uh, breaking down the barriers of racism, I think, is um, obviously critical uh, then and now. I think one of the things that's important about what the FE did in Louisville is that it didn't, um, you know, as I said. You know, the workers they were dealing with, the white workers they were approaching were, you know, many of them just about as racist as you could get, but they didn't um, presume that that meant they were uh, unredeemable, that they couldn't be good union members and that they couldn't come to understand the value of solidarity. So, um, but they also, you know, they made it very clear from the get-go, they didn't shy away from making that, um, from asserting that and, and explaining that. And so, um, it, it, it can be done, it's hard work. It has to, you know, I think you have to have a, a, um, an across the board commitment to that. And as they were organizing that plant, they had both black and white organizers involved, rank and file workers on the inside and the outside. Um, and so, um, and, and I think that it's, but it was, it was a, it, you know, Anne Braden's discussion of it being a constant campaign that is also critical. It's not something you can, okay, we won the union, we got a certain amount of black support and a certain amount of white support, and now we're done with the, um, with the, um, with the work of convincing people how solidarity works and unity works. It was necessary to continue to reinforce those efforts. It was necessary for white workers to see black workers in positions of leadership as stewards, for example, in the plant so that they could see that African American workers were fighting for them. Um, so, you know, in my little slide presentation, one of the um, slides about Louisville was an was a, um, a entire plant walkout that took place there when um, the entire plant walked out when International Harvester had tried to fire two union leaders, two stewards who were African American. So you had you know, a, an enormous majority of white workers who, um, who decided to walk out to protest the firing of two African-Americans, which was important enough to catch the attention of the African-American press in, um, in Louisville and elsewhere. So, um, so I, I, am I getting to the right answer there, Zach, sort of, or? But, I, you know, these examples that they are important to resurrect um, because the notion that racism is um, uh, so ingrained that it can't be overcome, the notion that this, the principles of solidarity can't be taught and explained and demonstrated and practiced, they have to be more, it has to be more than just something on a pamphlet, it has to be shown in practice, and that that can overcome uh, um, what workers have um, felt and experienced for, for generations. You can do that. It takes constant work. But, you know, some of these historical reminders of where it happened in places where that was really a tough assignment. And, you know, and it, and it did work in the United States, in the South. And if, it, if we could do it in 1946 and 1947 uh, um, in Louisville and Memphis and um, places like that, I think, you know, it can still be done and and so maybe those historical examples can be helpful i mean i would say to kind of build off of what tony's talking about in answer to this question about fighting back against the idea of bad unions being out there is that you know the first thing to do is to try to just have a conversation with that person to understand a little bit better what it is they are actually referring to like did they have a cousin who got their knees broken by somebody who said they were with a union back in the 40s and who was that right was that actually a mob or was it a union um you know you never know exactly what what might what people might be referring to or are people referring to more practical forms of discrimination within unions like Tony was kind of talking about, right? We have to actually know what people are referring to in order to be able to get around that. And the more important thing is probably to just do a more traditional organizing conversation where you try to get at what their issues are, right? And build an issue-based campaign before you jump straight to, it has to result in having a union, right? Um, there's a very classic saying that the 
the best organizer is a bad boss and we have plenty of bad bosses out there right now and what can we do to help people you know coalesce around a specific issue that they can win and that will help build people's confidence in the idea of workers having an organization because ultimately that's what a union is right it's not a big bureaucratic structure that comes in and you know goes and has does a handshake deal with the boss in order to make, wave a magic wand and make things better, right? That's the exact kind of union idea that we're trying to fight against with a, a them and us principle about workers are the ones who have the power. So it's when workers find that there are other workers who have their back that you can build an organization based around that kind of internal support and solidarity, we might say, to build the, the union that you really wanna see in your workplace. I don't know if this might be a good place to segue into talking a little bit more about the public sector, Zach. There's a lot of questions um, about that from different perspectives. And um, in UE, we do have a pretty significant local, local 150 who are in North Carolina and they largely represent public sector workers. But public sector workers don't have the right to have collective bargaining agreements in the state of North Carolina. This is something that UE waged a pretty big international solidarity campaign around and filed an official complaint with the ILO, the International Labor Organization, with uh, unions from other countries to say that these labor rights in North Carolina don't meet international standards for you know, what it means to for workers to have a fair place to work, right? And um, this local is based on, on the idea that if you want to see change in your workplace, then you have to join an organization where you can work with your coworkers to build the change that you want to see, right? It's not based on a contract. It, uh, it's based, you know, there are a few places where we have um, an agreement with a city maybe around, uh, you know, um, a, a memorandum of understanding on some particular kind of issue, right? Or we have the opportunity to meet and confer with management on a specific issue. We can help people navigate a grievance procedure. But ultimately, those things are the kinds of things that diffuse worker power. And the way that we actually win in North Carolina is when we bring people together for more direct kinds of actions. So we've done some occupations of the state capital in order to raise awareness around certain issues that workers there are facing. And those are done in collaboration with other organizations in the state as well. And I would say that's one of the things that's really key to building a union in a place that's not necessarily friendly to having unions is to work with other people that those workers trust. So whether that's faith organizations or um, a DSA chapter or whatever it might be that workers, you know, when they see that leader, when they hear that leader give them advice, they take that advice, right? Reach out to those people because it can be important to have them on your side. Um, this doesn't quite get to the same question of, you know, what about public sector organizing and how does that fit into the them and us unionism perspective? And I would say the first thing to do is to just try to step back and a couple of the questions that people wrote in the Q&A kind of reference this, uh, including one question that someone wrote that was more about a, uh, and uh, being in a nonprofit. The reality is, is that capitalists have really tried to structure all work in a business model, right? Where they want to get people to work as hard as they can, as long of hours as they can, in whatever way they might be able to manipulate people into doing that. So whether that's because you are so committed to the idea that your work is for the public good, that you'll do even unpaid labor, or whether that's um, because you know that, you know, if 
if the electricity isn't on, there are people out there who are not going to have their med home medical equipment running. And so you got to keep, got to keep the power going, right? This pressure that bosses have placed on working people is part of how they are manipulating that control over workers, right? That we feel, I mean, if you drill down into that, right? This is actually based in the idea that we have a great sense of obligation to each other, right? That we recognize that we do live in a community, that we don't exist as individuals, that we don't just want to live on, on an island. And even though our current capitalist structure is really intended on pitting workers against each other, the, the more we can do to push back on that idea that in fact we are a collective and we support each other, the more we're gonna be able to help people to see who's pushing this idea that we're getting alienated that we, uh, that we have to come to work or there's no other way to do this, right? What about a cooperative way to provide electricity to people? What about hiring more staff so that we're not all overworked, right? How can we you know, solve these problems in a different way? And I think that's really the first thing to think about when we think about the challenge of the public sector, right? The second thing to think about is the way that businesses have actually been really successful in demonizing the good jobs in the public sector because they've made private sector jobs so bad. And how do they do that? By busting unions, right? And how do they succeed in doing that? Well, because a lot of unions got really complacent about mobilizing their members and being able to push back against bad contracts and that whittled away good jobs because a lot, uh, you know, a lot of unions didn't organize uh, in, in the South where a lot of the jobs were going once Taft-Hartley passed and right to work became legal, right? So you could exploit workers more easily there because um, right to work is the idea that people are not obligated to pay union dues, but they might be getting the benefits of the contract anyways, right? It becomes really hard to maintain a union structure for a lot of people under those conditions. And, uh, and that, that idea succeeded in really weakening a lot of worker organizations. And also a lot of unions didn't pursue organizing in the South because whether or not they wanted to admit it, they weren't ready to get over their own racism that would be required in order to organize people of color who were the majority of the workers in the South, right? All of these things are tied together. And, you know, the only way out is to have a better vision of how we're supporting each other as working people. And um, to just constantly be prepared to question when a boss says like, oh, what will happen if this work doesn't get done? What will happen? Like, let's just pause and take a breath and think it through with each other and with a colleague, with a comrade, and um, think about where those pieces of power might actually be being played against us. So I'm going to stop there. I, I think I hit on a few of those different pieces. I don't want you to stop. That was all great. Uh, but so, okay, so, but every with everything, Carrie, that you were just talking about, discussing unpaid labor nonprofits, the public sector, pitting workers against one another, right to work in Taft-Hartley, uh, a weekend labor movement that relies, uh, even if it, assuming it even relies on this of just mobilizing people rather than organizing, like the kinds of things that Shane McAlevey talks about, uh, the South, and that, as you put it, like that all of these things are tied together. Like, so this is a DSA call. I think most people on here are in DSA. Um, I wanna ask a question to Tony and Carrie about, why should workplaces be the site for advancing socialist principles and politics or put another way what role should socialists play in advancing workplace organizing so we know that there's all these workers issues right these things that we're all talking about here like affect workers but what about workers at work and what about socialists at work well okay i mean I think the simple answer to that, and it goes back to what I said about the need for a Marxist sense of surplus value and uh, labor and profit is that we wanna organize workers in the workplace and talk Im immediately and, and continually about the workplace because that's where the power is. Uh, you know, we, that's where workers' power lies, whether you're talking about these enormous factories of um, past decades or whether you're talking about 
um, public schools or universities or hospitals or small shops. It's where you work that you have your power and where you can also come to see that power in a way I think that um, is critical to organizing. Uh, it doesn't take, you know, you, Zach and Perry are the experts on actually doing this, but it doesn't take much for workers to come to see that in small job actions uh, or in big ones. I mean, one of the reasons the FE uh, leadership at least tacitly continued to support those kind of wildcat strikes, what were called wildcat strikes, but actually had leadership support is that they knew that that exposed workers to how much power they had to walk off the job and shut down the machines and have the managers come running over and have them come in and plead with people to get back to work. There's not much that um, uh, beyond that that could be more empowering and liberating to, to workers. So um, I think you gotta, you gotta start in the workplace. I mean, and that's, I think what the FE did in Louisville and then why they were able to, to be at least um, for a time successful in that. And workers had embraced their power and their ability to confront authority uh, um, in where they worked and that they could then, and they built those bonds where they worked and then they could take those into the community um, to challenge other authorities and to make the ties between what um, uh, the local government was doing and how that affected what was going on uh, within their plant. So um, it's where the power is. And I would say it's, you know, it's also about trying to be creative. I think some of the questions get at this a little bit of, you know, I work in a small shop, how can we possibly do this? You know, those kinds of constraints are real. So what can you do, right? Maybe it's not a full-fledged union that's affiliated with some kind of larger body, but could you start talking with your coworkers about how much better it would be if you didn't have to rely on your employer for health insurance, right? So you can bring our conversations about single-payer healthcare into your workplace because the reality is, is that uh, if, if we did, didn't have to rely on our employers for health insurance, then people would have a lot more freedom over where they worked and what kind of work they had to engage in. And in a moment like a pandemic, people wouldn't be worrying about having a job in order to know whether or not they'd be able to pay a hospital bill if they unfortunately got COVID-19, right? Um, yeah, I'll, I, I mean, I think, I think the other, thing that's important for a socialist to think about in their workplace is, you know, are there ways that you can help lift up other leaders in your workplace, right? Can you help identify the people who are the natural leaders and help advance their political development and maybe a one-on-one -on -one capacity? And maybe that in the long run will also have an impact on, on your workplace. Absolutely, thank you, Carrie. Um, I'm gonna do one, maybe one last question before we wrap it up. Uh, there's been a lot of folks uh, for good reason who have been asking about this thing called Ewok. And so Carrie, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this uh, curious partnership between uh, UE and DSA to organize workers during a pandemic. Sure. So EWOC stands for the Emergency Worker Organizing Committee. And this really came about in a very natural way. Um, there were folks in DSA who saw the pandemic causing massive job losses right away. And they saw people scrambling who didn't understand what their rights were and how could they help. And we in UE also, you know, one of our principles is uh, also rooted in organizing the unorganized, right? That's how we unite all workers in part is by thinking about those who aren't even in our shops yet. And um, we were thinking about how can we reach out to some of these people who are looking for, you know, 
how can they do something on the job to protect their safety in the pandemic? Or how can they um, get their workers, their workplace to give them more sick leave? And, and we have some experience with things like that, right? So how could we offer that back to people? And so we just kind of naturally connected with some of the folks um, who were working on that on DSA side. And it's a really amazing set of collaborations. There are a lot of really experienced labor folks in there, but who have kind of settled on a model that's very much like the Bernie Sanders distributed organizing model in which people who know something about unions are helping to train other people to know more so that they can answer questions when they come in from folks all over the country. And um, some people just help with the kind of intake side of this and help sort people into, a, a, you know, a, a person who might be able to answer the more specifics for their field. Whereas some people help folks organize an on the job action around a really specific pressing issue. And then some things might become a union campaign, right? Um, but it's not necessarily about just finding a lead for a hot shop. It's about how can we bring the expertise that we have to bear to empower working people right now who are struggling in this moment. And uh, you know, helping more people to realize that they have been classified as essential workers so in order for their bosses to be able to exploit them. Well, what can we do to kind of claw back some of their power and for them not to get sick on the job, right? Um, so if you're one of those people who is wondering about, you know, how can I organize my shop? Um, and maybe UE is not even the right union for you, right? I'd encourage you to go check out Ewok. Um, because you will get a response from somebody who is trained to look at your specific question, your specific field, and help you find somebody that can, um, can help you improve your workplace. You know, it's important to know that even if you don't have a union, you do actually have rights in our country. Not, they're not great. We are, we're, you know, on the comparison of labor rights in the world, the US does not do well, but we do have some rights, um, especially if you're in a private sector workplace, you have the ability to do a job action with your coworkers, even if you don't have a union. And in fact, in some cases, you have more rights that are protected to do that than if you do have a union that might have a no strike clause in it, right? Um, so I, I think hopefully that sufficiently answers uh, what Ewok is and how it might help you. Right on. Thank you, Carrie. So for folks uh, who want to learn more about Ewok, uh, if you are a worker who needs some help organizing in your workplace, or if you are a longtime seasoned veteran master organizer and want to help other people organize, go to that link that we just dropped in the chat right there uh, and get involved. A uh, couple other things real quick as we wrap up. Uh, as always, if you are not yet a member or if your dues have lapsed, you need to renew them, uh, you should join DSA and get involved in this. We recently just surpassed, I think, 85,000 members, making us the largest uh, socialist organization in the U.S. in decades and decades. Um, if you are already a member of DSA, um, and are a member of a union or want to be or are active in your local labor uh, committee or working group or branch but are not yet a part of the DSLC and again that's the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission that's the intake form there all you got to do is fill that out uh, for that one you do have to be a DSA member first so again you should join if you haven't yet and then get involved in the DSLC uh, one last time for folks who want to read more about them and us unionism uh, from UE. There's the link to the website in the PDF. Uh, and one last thing about the DSLC, we are having our first uh, DSLC membership meeting um, on Monday, December 7th. That's going to be at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, everybody who is uh, in DSA and a part of the DSLC is encouraged to Doing this call is the first one that we've done so far. Uh, Would have done one sooner, except we got blindsided by a global pandemic and a lot of other bullshit <laughs> this year, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, so please forgive us for taking so long on that one. And then as Tony had mentioned earlier, 
Um, we're also doing another DSLC first. We are doing a DSA labor book club around Tony's book, The Long Deep Grudge. Uh, if you click that last link there, you can get the information about the dates, uh, which is gonna be February 7th, 14th, 21st, and February 28th. Uh, all of February is gonna be about Radical FE, um, hanging out with Tony and your comrades from DSA. So um, gotta wrap this up. It's just about time. Uh, I do just wanna say once again, thank you to Tony uh, and Carrie, uh, all the people you don't see on the screen who are doing important behind the scenes legworks, making this thing happen. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for joining us for this call tonight. So um, whatever you're doing, like organize the unorganized, making your union radical if it's not radical enough, keeping your radical union radical, whatever it is, keep it up. Uh, and again, if you haven't yet, join DSA. So thanks again. Have a good night. Can I can I do one more thing? Can I say one more yes. thing? Yeah, go for it, <laughs> I just wanted to say, um, first of all, thanks for it to everybody. And I really do feel badly that we couldn't get to more of the questions because they were fabulous. Um, but as a historian, I just want to leave one last um, note here on the table because look, you know, to some extent, some of the models that I present or talked about these enormous plants with, uh, you know, uh, such a potential for um, bringing a whole bunch of workers into unions at once. You know, that doesn't, that's not what we're confronted with now. We've got totally different um, ways we've got to think about organizing. But the reason that history for socialists, for workers is so critical is because we can see that um, how discouraging and how difficult things looked in the past and how they were overcome. I mean, we've, Lots of people were raising questions about overcoming anti-union sentiment and you know, going up against um, racism or the power of the government. I mean, if you think these things are challenging and difficult now, go back and see what it was like for workers in the 1920s. And one of the things I talk about in my book is over, you know, that International Harvester had this incredibly sophisticated network of company unions. Carrie talked about the rights that workers have now, even if they're not in a union. Workers in the 1920s before uh, the New Deal had no rights, nothing to protect you from arbitrary dismissals, from harassment, from wage cuts, from safety issues, nothing. So workers rose up, someone in the comments, I think talked about those critical sparks. Workers rose up and challenged that like on uh, the West Coast that Zach was talking about, not in a moment that was expected, not um, when you know every, all the ducks were lined up and everything was, was, uh, was ready for it. And, and, and radical, Rank and file leaders were there to meet that challenge and to um, and to bring something amazing to fruition with the rise of industrial unionism. So, you know, this is where the encouragement comes in. This is why history is important, not to find the exact model that you can apply to your workplace, but to recognize that um, how much difficulty, how hard it was um, before, and yet there was so much triumph. So um, I think that's um, that's something that uh, I think we can leave it on and, or else, unless someone else has something to say. But I really thought this was fabulous. So thanks everybody for being here.